Hi, we are at Tour Books. Uh, I'm out here for New York Comic Con, and we wrangled my editor, Davey, and my agent, Joshua, into chatting with us today. Say hi, Davey. Hi. hi say hi, Joshua. Hello. Uh, Davey has been my editor for five years now. I think so. Six something like years, that. something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, after uh, moving over and is now the publisher of Tor. Yep. Uh, and so moving up in the world. Uh, Just a little bit. Yeah, basically the top honcho yep. here. Uh, and I met Joshua at the Nebula Awards weekend in 2002. Uh, and he signed me in 2003 for my first book, Elantris. And so he's been here for the long haul. And we thought, we're here, we're doing lots of meetings, I should wrangle you guys and chat about with you about the publishing industry, because people are curious. So I want to actually ask you guys, we're going to start with Davey, what do you think the health of the publishing industry is right now? Um, and oh, you know, how are things going? Things are going very well. I personally think the health of the publishing industry is great, at least in terms of my world, which is majority science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. We're obviously having a great time with Wheel of Time. Yes. Did you like that pun? That was yeah, a dumb yeah, pun. I like yeah. that. Um, yeah. And we also have Dune, you know, which is a really nice thing for us. But also, I feel like we've had some really great breakouts recently. You know, it's. have you noticed this? When I first broke in, mm -hmm. going to conventions and things and talking to the publisher, there was this sense of doom and gloom. There's always publishing. been a sense of and doom. And I'm like, I, I said to Joshua at one point, I'm like, is publishing dying? And he said, publishing has been dying since the late 1900s, mm -hmm. where every new revolu revolution in uh, the industry has convinced everyone that no one's going to be making money in this. And yet the industry has continued to grow, despite the fact um, that the industry has been dying for well over a century now. It is what, true. What do you think, Joshua? What's the health of the industry right now? Um, I think on the whole, it's pretty good. Publishing came through the pandemic. You know, nobody in spring 2020 knew what to, what to expect, but publishing weathered the storm pretty well. Books were comfort food for a lot of people in 2020. Um, it's had some changes in terms of the mix between print and ebook and audio, and now maybe things are settling back into a different new normal. Um, there are always challenges in the industry. One of the big ones right now is, you know, Barnes & Noble is the one big bookstore chain we have, and it's very important to discoverability, especially for new writers. Yeah. And they've just changed a lot of their approach to book selling in right. ways that are super challenging for our new authors right they're it, not taking hardcovers for new authors as often uh do you think that they're going to move toward like the uk did where trade paperbacks become the kind of new norm um i don't think that that's going to happen you still go in the front of a store and see tons of hardcovers and mm -hmm. one of the merchandising changes they've made is actually front and centering a lot more of those hard covers and the like, you know, 12 entire facings of the new release hard covers that are in the front of every store. Um, so I don't see trade paperback replacing hard covers, but it's definitely replaced the mass market business which is a, a shadow of what it was when I started okay. in the industry. So for those who don't know, mass market are what we call the, pe the pocket size paperbacks. We don't actually have any of them here, but they're the little, the little ones. And then the trade paperbacks are the paperbacks the size of a hardcover. Uh, and in the UK, there's been a trend toward trade paperbacks uh, for some number of years. So uh, Davey, launching new authors. I've noticed, I feel like the, I agree. I feel like the publishing industry is in a decent place. I feel like more people are making a living as writers now than ever have in the history of the world, mm -hmm. which is, says that things, you know, things are good. What I, what I noticed though, is it seems like it's harder to launch a new author now than it ever has been before. Is that just because I'm seeing a lot of, um, you know, anecdotal evidence by people I know, or is that, do you think true? I think it's always been true. Like, mm. 
you have to make your bets and you have to be able to say, okay, this is a book we're going to get behind. This is a book we're going to really push. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a lot of passion behind it. And that starts from the editor and it goes to the whole marketing publicity team. And then it spreads from there. So I feel like we've had a higher than normal hit average okay. of debuts. Like really debuts are new to the list um, and really pushing them out in a bigger way. Uh, do you see publishing doing fewer debuts in the future, fewer better, or do you see them doing more debuts and trying, like, why I ask this is I feel like one of the challenges to the publishing industry has been indie publishing lately, which mm -hmm. is on the whole a great thing because more people are able to release more books. But what it did is it gobbled up a little bit of the mid list. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those niche books that you knew could sell pretty, um, pretty well to a select audience those are usually nowadays indie books. Mm -hmm. um, and with them taking bites out of the mid list, it's made me wonder, you know, um, are the publishers, how are the publishers reacting to that? It's a hard question because, okay, so separating out the debuts and breaking yes. them out, right? Mm -hmm. So like in terms of debuts, it's very, very, very easy to get lost and become a mid list book yeah. in some ways, like very quickly. Mid list, by the way, definition wise, is uh, a book that never hits the bestseller list, but sells consistently. So like if you have a book that's a passion project and you love mm -hmm. it and it, you know, it's X, Y, and Z and you think it's going to be amazing, you have no idea in terms of whether that book is going to have a long tail as it'll sell for many, many years and then build on each book or if it's going to do a smaller amount and then, you know, peter out as the series goes on. And yeah. most series, especially for people that work in science fiction and fantasy, most of our books are series. So it really has to be a book that continues to build over time. Right. Yeah, we have this par this uh, paradox in science fiction fantasy series where each subsequent book has to sell less than the books before it because you're selling already to a closed group of people who've read the previous books. Hopefully that group grows with each new one you release. You release a new book, more people pick up the first one, and then your potential for the later ones. But it is this weird paradox that each book has to be of a smaller amount in sales than the ones before. You just hope you're growing well, that. You're one of the few authors yeah. where you're seeing a growth from book mm -hmm. one to book two to book three, right? But the majority of books, because they do fall by a certain percentage, yeah. like you want that ongoing sale to be consistent. So even if there is that drop, yeah, that well, audience is continuously growing. We see a drop, but we see higher momentum. It's this weird thing. So if you take year one of Way of Kings, year two, year one of uh, Stormlight two, year one of Stormlight three, year one of Star Stormlight four, our numbers go up. Right? We sell more in a in in the first year. But if you look at the total, it's obvious that Stormlight four sells less than Stormlight one. It's been out way uh, less time and things like that. So it's just this odd thing. Uh, Joshua, um, new authors, debuts. Uh, this is one of your favorite things to do. I know you love getting a debut author and just shepherding them through. Do you think it is harder now or is that, you know, is, is it just different? Um, I want to say that it is actually harder. Mm -hmm. Um, because brick and mortar is key to discoverability and we have less brick and mortar. Yeah. Um, and it used to be that a publisher could write a check, basically, to guarantee a certain amount of placement for debut. Right. Tom um, Doherty, um, who was um, Davy's predecessor in this role, he famously said to me once, and he told a lot of people this, the best billboard for a book is lots of books on the shelf. So if he can write a check and get lots of books on the shelf, to the readers, that helps them discover it. It's like a, you know, a billboard on the shelf. Oh, what is this book? Um, but most people don't buy their books in bookstores anymore. Now, with new authors, it's still really, really key. Yeah. And so even for one recent book we had that's done pretty well, one of the differences is it's in every Barnes & Noble, but it doesn't have the guaranteed three or five copies of store that right. the old placement, paid placement, used to guarantee. Elantris so, was, had six copies uh, in its first order 
on ev in paperback on every Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Which um, is huge. Which yeah. Is so if you have only one copy of the book to start with, yeah. the moment that one copy is gone, even if you have the best replenishment system in the world and reorder quickly, yeah. you're going to have a period of time when the new book isn't visible on the shelf in that particular store at all. Yeah. And that is more likely to happen now with more books. And I think that that is a challenge that people have to confront today that was less important when there were two major retail chains and when the publisher could say for a book that, yes, we are going to guarantee you the three copies. Right. That we can, you know, take care of getting you three copies in every store rather than one. But I also always point out it's never been easy to be a debut author. Even to sell your book in the first place, you've got to be writing at the 98th percentile of people wanting to be debut authors. Yeah. So it's never been easy. And that is a perspective that I always try and remember is however hard or difficult it is relative to yesteryear, you've always been and will always be talking about something that is incredibly difficult to do, is break in and then become successful. I, um, I like to say that I was the last generation of people who sold through bookstores. Um, uh, that's, you know, like we said, six copies of Elantris in every Barnes and Noble, uh, a similar order from Borders. Um, uh, discoverability was high. I broke out in 2005. The Kindle didn't launch until 2009 or 2010. Um, and ebooks were just not a thing back then. And indeed, Audible wasn't even really a thing. Audiobooks weren't. And so my initial sales were 99% that print edition, which people went to bookstores and browsed, and that's how they found books. Uh, these days, um, my books bounce around between one fifth print, two fifths audio, two fifths ebook, to about a one third, one third, one third, depending on the book and in the the course of its life. Uh, the longer a book is out, um, the the more it shifts toward print, uh, just a little bit, um, and things like that. Um, Davey, I wanted to ask, are um, my results unusual in the market? Do me selling two-fifths in audio uh, for the other sci-fi fantasy books, do you notice that I am more heavily skewed toward ebook and audio mm -hmm. than others? Where would you say the average is for, uh, for a sci-fi fantasy book on your list? You mm -hmm. know, for me, for science fiction, it tends to be much more on E and audio. On what? On ebooks and audio. Okay, so you're saying other books are more ebook and audio than mine, um, less print. So I have a higher print than some of yours. Sometimes yeah. it, it really depends it really on the depends. author. Um, I've always wondered if my books, uh, often being so big, drive people to ebook and audio. Mm -hmm. Yet having so much art in the Stormlight Archive books would drive people toward the print. So I've always wondered where's that balance. Uh, Joshua, do you see with your other authors? What kind of balance are you seeing? Is it just all over the place as well? It is all over the place, but big picture, the most likely thing we see for our clients is people who have practically no print presence when I go look on mm -hmm. BookScan every week. That's but like the Nielsen ratings for books. Yeah, it, it just tells you every week how many copies every book sold. And we have, um, you know, authors who are basically invisible in print. You will not see them on the shelf at Barnes & right. Noble, but are still selling a good chunk of ebook because they are established authors. People right. want to buy them. And the ebook is the format that is kind of convenient and accessible.
So it's to like them. for a lot of the what we call backlist yeah. books that were published a while ago by authors that are still modestly popular, but they aren't worth carrying and keeping that book on the shelf. You're seeing a lot of that moving to um to ebook. Makes me yeah. wonder why we're not seeing more orders up front for authors when some of those legacy books are not on the shelves. What are they doing with their shelf space? I guess it's turning into manga, huh? I mean, it all changes, but like I would say yeah. in terms of ebooks versus print, I've heard from a lot of authors that their fans love to buy the ebook to read mm -hmm. and the print book to hold. Yes. This is why I push for uh, bundling, where you yeah. can get them both together and have been doing so for many years. All right. Last question for you guys is about audio. Um, I have noticed that audiobooks seem to be the growth industry mm -hmm. in publishing these days. I have noticed my audiobook numbers going up while more than the other numbers are going down, meaning we are gaining new readers through audiobook. Uh, perhaps because of the podcast uh, revolution that has happened, people, you know, we're well into the podcasting era now. People are used to listening to things while they commute. They are moving away from the radio and moving toward uh, narrative and things like that. Um, what ex like what do you see in audiobooks? Like, why do you think audiobooks are doing so well? Uh, what do you like about audiobooks? Um, that sort of thing. I love audiobooks because I feel like they're you can have them anywhere, you know, yeah. like you can have them on your phone. You can do them in the car. Like it is one of the best formats. And for you me, listen at one X speed, two X speed. One I, and a half? I try to listen, but I don't have as much patience for audio because uh -huh. I tend to be like, I, I tend to read a lot faster than okay. the norm. So you don't do audio book that much yourself. You just know about, the Oh, I just know the numbers. So like yeah. for me, my numbers are deeply strong in audio and they mm -hmm. have been growing stronger and stronger year on year. Um, I have a son who's dyslexic. And um, audiobooks are the way he experiences narrative. He loves reading, but he has to do it via audiobook. And I think that's one of the things that audiobooks provide some accessibility um, in ways. And I think that audiobooks probably would have been a really big deal back in the 80s and 90s if you didn't have to buy 30 CDs. Yep. Or, you know, I remember having an audiobook when I was a kid. And it was cassette tapes, and you had to like pop them out of this like plastic big, you, you had basically like a briefcase yep. full of like 60 cassette tapes to listen to this audiobook of The Wheel of Time or something like that. I guess it wouldn't have been the 80s if it was The Wheel of Time, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joshua, thoughts on audiobooks? Um, I mean, it's been, you know, we, we talk about publishing as an industry that doesn't change, but the audio business, especially for science fiction and mm -hmm. fantasy, has been a really big change. Um, it didn't exist in the genre because it was driven mostly by libraries. Yeah. Historically, libraries haven't concentrated on science fiction and fantasy. So the buying for of audio rights was not welcoming of the genre. Yeah. Um, even before Amazon purchased Audible, that was something Audible realized needed to change. So starting in the mid to late 2000s, the audio market became more receptive to genre and the way that that has just you know kind of continued to grow and grow where it used to be the exception to sell something and now it's the exception that you don't yeah that has been probably the biggest enduring actual like change the ebook, even I don't think, has changed the business. Other, it, it it it's taken down the barriers to entry, but I don't think it's actually changed the business. Interesting. The way the growth of audio. Has I mean, done. I do remember when we sold audio rights for two sticks of gum, uh, and now suddenly our audio book rights you know will sell for as much as the rest of the rights, and so yeah. um, well. Thank you guys for taking some time. Uh, I know this wasn't terribly long, but we're kind of squeezing it in at the end of a long day. Uh, you're both very awesome, and I appreciate you. 
And uh, we hope that you will all be looking at getting some of the new tour books I just released. Um, we have uh, we have Secret History. We have uh, Bastille versus Evil Librarians are both out right now via tour. And uh, I hope you guys will look into them.